This. Sorry, Senator Smith, your time had expired. I'm not sure what happened to the clock there. Senator Gallagher, you do have 20 seconds if you want it. Uh, thank you. Well, I'll just give you a few uh, budget facts from this government. They've doubled the debt prior to the pandemic. They racked up a trillion dollars of debt without enough to show for it. They're the second highest taxing government in the last 30 years and is now collecting $4,500 more per person than Labor in 2013. They have no credibility on budget management. It being, it being 2 p.m., we will now move to questions. Senator Keneally. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. An aged care manager in Victoria who has been forced to work 80-hour weeks due to staff shortages has said, and I quote, during our recent outbreak, I requested isolation gowns and N95 masks from the national stockpile. Instead, we received latex gloves and hand sanitizer. I laughed, then I went into my office and cried. It's like a bad joke. More than two years into this pandemic, why is the Morrison-Joyce government still failing aged care workers? The Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbert. Thank you, thank you Mr. President, and, and I don't accept the premise of Senator Keneally's questions. Um, and as I indicated to the chamber yesterday, uh, we have acknowledged that there were some issues with supplies out of the national stockpile. Order. That's one of the things that we've been working on. Uh, Coles, Woolworths, a whole range of organisations indicated Order, that they had supply chain issues because they had workforce out of their no uh, logistics chains, uh, and that impacted on their capacity to deliver. Mr. President, I'm advised that in respect of this facility, this particular facility, uh, the um, sky, size and the scale of the delivery, uh, and this happened with a number of facilities, Mr. President, uh, that the size and the scale of the delivery meant that the deliveries were split into a number of different packages, mm. into a number of different deliveries. So things different. So, oh, so, so things would way. have arrived at different times because Senator of Ray, those issues Senator we Watt. had with the logistics chain, Mr. President. The Senator government has Watt. the government has acknowledged that we had issues uh, with deliveries out of the national Are stockpile. That's what we have spent all of January working on to fix, because That's the logistics job. operators that were supplying and moving the products, Mr. President, had staff effects from COVID. That's why it happened, Mr. President, like so many other logistics chains uh, around the country. For the Labor Party to expect that one part of the economy, one part of the community won't be impacted by COVID when the rest is, is just completely naive, Mr. President, and it shows how much they're prepared to play politics with the pandemic rather than actually deal with the pandemic. Correct. They're not interested in finding solutions. They're not interested in actually dealing with the issues that are real, and they are real for that provider who's uh, made comment to the local media. Uh, we're interested in dealing with the problems, uh, and that's what we'll continue to do. Uh, Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. A nursing manager in New South Wales said, and I quote, I have never felt pressure like this. The reality is the government has made a huge amount of mistakes. My staff should not be on the pittance they are being paid. I don't think anyone in aged care is okay. Will the minister say sorry to this nursing manager for the mistakes he and his government have made? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. The first thing we'll do is acknowledge again the magnificent work that uh, aged care providers and their workforce have done during COVID, Mr. President. Uh, we know that they've doubled up on shifts. We know that they've uh, worked really hard in the interests of the residents that they're caring for. Uh, we understand that, Mr President, and we've supported the aged care sector with PPE, with rapid antigen tests, with surge workforce, um, Mr President, with, 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 a program, with a program to cover the costs, the additional costs of managing uh, a COVID-19 outbreak within a facility. Uh, there have been a whole range of measures that have been in place right through the pandemic, Mr President, and at certain points of time during the pandemic, there have been circumstances that have arisen that have impacted on the capacity to, to appropriately deliver uh, those services, Mr. President. And I've just been through the point of telling, uh, telling uh, the chamber about the issues Minister, we've had with Minister, supply chains, Mr. President. Your time 
has expired. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Aged care nurse Sue has asked, and I quote, Mr. Morrison, do I go to Mr. Smith, who is in pain, or Mrs. Jones, who's on the floor, or John, who has behaviour problems and is intruding into other people's rooms? I have floor alarms going and buzzers going. What would you like me to do? What does the Minister for Aged Care Services think Sue should do? Minister. Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. I mean, the question is an example of how cheap the Labor Party are really trying to be in relation to uh, the delivery of aged care services, Mr. President. And, and it's impossible. It's impossible for me to understand. The, it, the, it is impossible Order. for me to try from the question and interpret the decisions that uh, Sue has had to make, Mr. President. And, but I acknowledge how difficult they are. Order. But I acknowledge how difficult they are, Mr. President. And we have provided over 80,000 shifts of surge workforce around the country, Mr. President. And we have provided additional resources wherever we can. We have not spared any expense with respect Senator to supporting Kennedy. the sector with those workforces. I know, Mr. President, I know that the choices that Sue has had to make are going to be yeah. difficult. Uh, and they are the stresses that all Australians have felt through the health care system, through the aged care system, through NDIS, some very, very difficult Minister, through a whole range Minister, of workplaces in managing COVID-19. has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Can the Minister outline to the Senate how the Liberal and National Government's plan is delivering investment jobs and opportunities for regional Australia? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Catamar, for your long advocacy for regional Australia. Well, our government has been just focusing on getting it done to ensure our regions are sustainable, prosperous and secure by investing and delivering thousands of projects on the ground and delivering local jobs. Projects that build on the natural competitive advantage of our regions and supporting them to be more resilient in the face of key challenges, whether it's drought, whether it's bushfire or whether it's indeed COVID-19. And it is having a real impact. The Regional Australia Institute has just released a report today that says our unemployment rate out in the regions is at 3.8 per cent, the lowest in decades, and our job vacancies are skyrocketing. 70,000 We've got great long-term, well-paid careers right across the regions. Come and join us. Our key industries of agriculture Order. and mining are booming, with the resource and energy export earnings forecast to hit a staggering $379 billion with hundreds of projects in the pipeline. Ag uh, has forecast to hit $73 billion, and it's well on the way to its target of $100 billion by 2030. We've invested over $100 billion in infrastructure projects, in roads and rail, to better connect our rural communities and shift our product, not just to capital cities, but to ports and international markets. We've spent $3.5 billion on dams, pipelines and weirs, Senator because we Watt. know that we create wealth Minister, by adding Minister, water Minister, to our ingenuity. Minister, 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 please resume your seat. Senator Watt, the interjections are coming far too frequently. Interjections are always disorderly. Senator Mackenzie has a pretty powerful voice and I could not hear parts of her answer. Senator Mackenzie, you have the call. Thank you, Mr President, for your protection. Um, we've put $5 billion back into community for drought resilience and we're tapping into emergency industries such as the hydrogen industry and putting $1.3 billion on the table for that. I could go on and on. We're putting record investment into the regions. But I tell you what, I would love to hear someone over the other side of this chamber talking about regional Australia. Albo didn't even Minister, mention it in his National Press Minister, Club of speech your last time week. Has expired. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Uh, th thank you, Mr President. That's great news, Minister. Can the Minister further advise how supporting regional and remote communities with, will strengthen Australia's future economic prosperity? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. We know that when the regions are strong, Australia is strong. A third of our population 
lives outside of capital cities, and a vast amount of our GDP is produced out there too. That's why we're investing in infrastructure, connectivity and resilience for the regions not just building short-term impacts, but for generations. Take the project like the Inland Rail. More than 400 Australian businesses have already shared in the billions of dollars we're investing in that project. The ARTC, for example, has over $140 million of contracts out there that are building jobs in places like Rockhampton and Wagga Wagga as they produce the concrete sleepers. Uh, we've expected to boost this project is going to uh, boost our GDP by more than $18 billion over the next half a century. We've got a long-term vision for this country and for the regions. And it's also going to reduce our emissions by 750,000 tonnes, which is great news as we uh, put more product on rail Minister, and off-road. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Canavan, <coughs> a second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr um, President. Uh, can the minister outline the risks to Australia's economic security if our regions are not supported? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, there are very real risks and challenges to Australia's economic security if we don't back our farmers, our foresters, our miners, our fishers and our manufacturers. But the greatest risk is sitting opposite our me right now. We know, we know that Adam Bant, Adam Bant and Albo have done the sneaky deal and Adam just could not wait for the election Order. campaign to outline it. Order. He couldn't wait. Minister. What are they going to do? A moratorium. Minister. A moratorium on all, all Minister. new. Please resume your seat. I'm, I, I want to re-announce, Adam. I would remind you that we need to address members of the other place by their correct titles. Minister, you have the call. I will be. I will be. I will be respectful. Um, Adam Bant, he's sealing the deal with Albo and demanding Labor a moratorium till COP27. That's four years, four years on all new coal, gas, and oil projects, in support. In support. That is going to kill hundreds of projects tens of thousands of local jobs in places like the Hunter, in places like Western New South Wales and Central Queensland. Minister, Minister your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, uh, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Does the Minister think that $22 per hour is enough for aged care workers? Uh, the Minister for Senior Australians, uh, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as I've said in this chamber before and I've said on a number of occasions uh, in front of your committee, uh, the determination of the salary for people across Australians is a matter for Fair Work Australia. Which, um, it is, it is, uh, which was actually legislated by, which was legislated by the Labor Party, Mr President. It was legislated uh, by the... Um, and so, Mr President... What I, what I, what I believe, Mr. President, what I believe is, is that all Australians in the workforce, but particularly those working in aged care, should be fairly compensated. There is a case open right now, being considered by Fair Work Australia, in relation to the wages of uh, Australians uh, working in the aged care sectors, Mr. President. We have done, as we said we would do in response to the Royal Commission, uh, provided support and advice to that case. Um, uh, as, it been, as, as, it, as it has progressed, Mr. President. But, Mr. Order. President, um, uh, Order. Mr. President, uh, Order. When, when Mr. Albanese was asked about this a week or so ago, do you say that aged care workers uh, to have a, uh, should have a 25 per cent pay rise? Do you agree Minister, with that, Mr. President? Minister, Minister, Senator. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Direct or relevance. This Senator was Keneally. a fairly. Just, sorry, I just I could not actually hear you. So please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, point of order on relevance. Uh, this was a fairly tightly worded question. It had no embroidery. It was very direct. It was literally, does the minister believe the pay of $22 per hour is sufficient for aged care workers? It made no mention of anything about the industrial relations system or other parties in the parliament. It was a fairly tightly worded question. I, I, I ask I, you to bring I, the minister back to the lead. Senator Keneally, I've been listening to the minister answer the question. I believe that his first part of the answer was relevant to the question. 
um, the minister was straying into other territory. Uh, so I have allowed you to bring the minister back to the question. I will listen carefully to his answer. Minister, you have 40 seconds remaining. You have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and, and I have directly responded to the question, but it is pertinent that Mr. Albanese, when asked about this, said it's up to the Fair Work Con Commission to determine what the figure will be. Minister, now, they don't want to hear minister, that, Mr. President. Sen order. Senator Pratt. Order. Senator Keneally. Thank you, and I thank you for your previous comments about the minister straying from the, the question. Uh, again, a point of order on direct relevance. He is straying again. Is Senator Birmingham. Yes, oh. Mr. President. Mr. President, on the point of order. Now, the question was about wage rates. The minister is absolutely within his rights uh, to outline how wage rates are set and indeed to use direct quotes about the validity of the system that sets those wage rates. Now, the minister was not making a political point from what I heard at the time Senator Keneally took her point of order. He was using a direct quote about the system that sets wage rates, which was entirely relevant uh, to the context of the answer he was giving. Senator Gallagher, on the point of order. On the point of order, um, Mr President, and following on from Senator Birmingham's comments, the minister was making a political point. He was quoting from a transcript about the Leader of the Opposition. And he was making a political point. Order. It had no relevance at all, and it, it was it was ignoring Order. Order. it was ignoring the direction that you just provided to the minister. He completely ignored your direction. On the point of order, yes, on the, on the point of order, Mr. President, can I um, point out here that that all uh, the minister is doing is confirming how our wage system works by referring to someone who has been a member of this parliament for many years, Mr Albanese. The only implication you can take from the points by Senator Gallagher is she does not think that Mr Albanese is an authority about how our system works, that he does not know, apparently, Order. how our system works, because all Senator the minister Canavan. is doing Senator is Canavan. quoting someone who probably knows, probably knows how the system point. works. It's not Senator a political Canavan. point. Resume your seat. I, I, I think we've all heard enough. I allowed you to direct the minister back to the question, as I believe there was a risk that he was straying from the direct topic. I continue to listen to the minister's answer. I, uh, uh, I will continue to listen. I am not yet um, convinced that the minister is not being relevant, but I am listening very carefully. Minister, you have the call for 31 seconds. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as I've said, I believe that all Australians in the workforce, particularly those in aged care, should be fairly remunerated. Um, the level of that remuneration should be determined by Fair Work Australia. That's what the government said, and that's exactly what Mr Albanese said. He agrees. So, Mr. President, so I believe that they should be fairly remunerated. I know they work hard. I appreciate Minister, how hard they work. Your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The opposition isn't asking about the tribunal's view. We are asking the minister responsible for aged care services and an aged care workforce whether you believe, as the minister responsible, that pay rates of $22 an hour is sufficient for aged care workers? You should answer that question and not avoid it. Order. Order. Senator Abetz. I will not, I will not call the minister. I'm, I haven't got a mask on. Um, I will not call the minister in there till there is silence. Senator Betts. Minister. Thank you, Mr President. I'll say it again. I think that all Australians in the workforce should be fairly remunerated. The balance of how that remuneration is established in relation to all other elements of the economy is rightly and properly determined by Fair Work Australia. That's why Fair Work Australia was set up. I presume that's why the Labor Party established for Fair Work Australia. And uh, whatever pay rise is granted to 
uh, workers in the aged care sector, Mr Albanese agrees with the government that it's up to Fair Work Australia to decide. That's the process. Mr President, I believe they deserve Order. a fair, work's, a fair day's work for a fair day's pay, and they work hard, Mr President. They work extremely hard. I've acknowledged countless times in this chamber how hard they work. I've spoken to aged care workers, Mr President. And, Mr President, so I believe that they should be fairly recom recompensed, and, Mr President, uh, I will continue to maintain that. Senator Order. Senator Gallagher, second supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Does the minister f uh, believe that aged care workers are fairly remunerated now? And have you personally asked Mr Morrison to make a submission to the Fair Work Commission work value case in support of a wage rise for aged care workers? And you referred earlier to help and support provided by the government. Please outline what that help and support is. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr President. My understanding is that the advice that we've provided to Fair Work Australia uh, has been published by Fair Work Australia. So if Fair Work Australia wrote to the government, asked us to make some submissions in relation to this case. We have done that and we will provide any information uh, that they seek, Mr President. Uh, there, there's Order. one, there's one, uh, one element that wasn't a matter for Fair Work Australia uh, to determine and we've advised them of that and that was in relation to future budgeting. Uh, Mr President, uh, and, and so we have and we will continue to provide the information that Fair Work Australia requires in the determinant of this case, Mr President. Uh, the, the, the government has responded to the Royal Commission's recommendations uh, and we have said in response to the Royal Commission's recommendations that Fair Work Australia is the appropriate Minister, place for the determination Minister, of wages. Please resume your seat. Senator Keneally on a point of order. Your direct relevance. Uh, the question also included, did, Ms. did the minister personally ask Mr Morrison to make a submission to the Fair Work Commission? With 13 seconds left, we'd appreciate it if the minister could get to that part of the question. You, a minister can be directly relevant to any part of the question. You have brought the minister's attention to a particular part of the question. Senator Colbeck, you have the call for 13 seconds unless you have finished your answer. Thank you, Mr President. As Al Mr Albanese said, it's up to the Fair Work Commission what that figure should be. Fair Work Australia is the appropriate determinant, determinant of wages in this country. The government believes that as well. Senator Hewitt, order. Order. On my right and my left. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is ensuring support is available to victims of domestic, family and sexual violence through 1800 Respect into the future? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question on this really important subject. 1800 Respect is the national gateway for all Australians who are seeking help or assistance uh, who are affected by family, domestic and sexual violence. And it is an absolute priority of this government to ensure that we have uh, this national telephone and online counselling service is of the absolute highest quality so that people who rely on it can rely on it. And that's why we conducted an open and uh, a competitive procurement process to secure uh, the next provider to deliver 1800 Respect into the future. So on the 24th of January this year, I was pleased to announce that Telstra Health had been the successful provider, um, and that was following a very extensive process that enabled us to come up with the strongest service solution uh, and with the capability to provide a really high quality response uh, that was trauma informed and fit for purpose. So Telstra Health will deliver 1800 Respect for the next five years with the possibility of an extension. This is the first time that we've put in place a five-year contract for the service so that we can make sure that we have continuity and stability uh, in the service that we provide because we know it is so important to so many Australians. Um, through this process, we've overhauled the funding model. Uh, it is no longer a cost per contact uh, model. It's one based on the time that's needed to help the person and to make sure that 1800 Respect is funded on the basis of the user need. Uh, as our understanding of trauma and the per pervasive nature of gender-based violence continues to evolve, we are also ensuring that this service evolves to meet the diverse and complex needs of the people that rely on it. 
A stage transition will occur to make sure that there is no impact on the delivery um, at when Telstra Health take up the service provision in July. And can I take this opportunity to acknowledge the work of Medibank Health Solutions and their subcontractors who have been delivering this important commitment since Minister. 2010? Senator Hughes, a Thank supplementary you, Mr. question. President, can the minister outline the further improvements that are being made to 1800 Respect? Minister. A number of enhancements will be available into the future um, to ensure that 1800 Respect meets the needs of the diverse and complex needs of the people who, who rely on the service. New technology is one of the key things that are going to be built into the new platform. Uh, so additional options for users so that they can use um, text messages or video calls. And most importantly, there is a new mechanism which means that they can transfer between devices and platforms without needing to disconnect. Follow-up on refer referrals is also very important, uh, which we will do when it is safe to do so, to ensure that the needs that the person has, has sought have been met in the appropriate way. The new service offering will also include um, supported referrals by councillors to other appropriate supports within the broader service system. Importantly, we're acting on the advice from the sector to make sure these technological enhancements support it tell it a tell-it-once model to minimise the need for users to continually repeat their story. Senator Hughes, a second supplementary. Thank you. Minister, how is the government continuing to respond to the recommendations of the Respect at Work report through the additional support being provided by 1800 Respect? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Well, we all have a role to stopping sexual harassment and creating safe workplaces, and that's why we've ensured 1800 Respect expands its service offering uh, to provide psychological support and referrals to people affected by workplace uh, sexual harassment. Importantly, this particular uh, enhancement uh, responds to recommendation 54 of the Respect at Work report. Uh, our government has agreed or noted to all 55 recommendations in the report, and our response is about creating a new culture of respectful behaviour in workplaces across the whole of Australia. It's also our priority to ensure that 1800 Respect provides high quality and responsive support to people who need help and information, and it's important this includes victims of workplace sexual harassment. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to encourage anybody who has been impacted or knows someone who's been impacted by sexual assault. Uh, or family violence to call 1800 Respect on 1800 737 732 or go to our website. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Hume, representing the Minister for Communications. Two days ago, the government announced it would increase funding to the ABC, restore indexation and continue funding the enhanced news gathering program for an additional three years. That program, which sits outside of the ABC's base funding, allows the ABC to employ journalists in regional Australia, particularly in areas which would otherwise go without local news. More than 70 people are currently employed by this program and the continued funding shows the government believes it provides value for money. Could the minister explain why the government decided to keep this funding, the enhanced news gathering funding, outside of ABC's base funding? The minister representing the Minister for Communications, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Griff very much for his question and his enduring commitment to a strong and independent ABC, one that is shared by the government, and an ABC that provides quality broadcast services free of bias or political alignment and is reflective of our population and the values and expectations that, the, that all Australians have as they are the ones who fund the ABC. Certainly the government recognises the importance of the ABC and understands that Australians also value the services provided by our ABC. And we're committed to a strong and resilient ABC, operating efficiently and delivering the best possible outcomes with the substantial funding that it receives. And in fact, this ABC has more funding certainty than any other media organisation in Australia. At the moment, taxpayers fund the ABC with more than $1 billion every single year. And this is a substantial investment of public funds in our national broadcaster to enable it to provide television, radio and digital media services in line with its charter. Mr President, the budget for the next three years of ABC funding, commencing on the 1st of July 2022, was announced, as Senator Griff said, on the 7th of February this year. The ABC will receive $3.3 billion over the next three years 
to the 30th of June 2025. And as Senator Griff points out, this includes $45.8 million under the new Enhanced News Gathering Program to strengthen local public interest journalism in regional communities. Mr President, this represents an increase in funding compared to both the 2016 to 19 triennium and the 2019 to 2022 triennium. And the ABC will also receive indexation on that base operational funding, which does not include the 45.8 million under the Enhanced News Gathering Program. The ABC will also, however, include receive funding to continue Minister, and to expand audio description Minister, services to blind and vision impaired. Your time impaired. has expired. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, you didn't directly answer my question, which related to why enhanced news gathering is kept outside of the ABC's core budget. Now, some have claimed the government keeps it outside as a way of keeping the broadcaster dependent and compliant. Could you rebut this by explaining the other components, perhaps even on notice, of ABC funding which sit outside the base funding if there are any? Minister. Uh, Senator Griff, I doubt that anyone in this chamber would call the ABC compliant or dependent. Uh, in fact, the ABC were delighted with the decision, government's decision to commit $3.3 billion over the next three years, and that was a direct quote from the chair of the ABC, Ida Buttrose. In fact, she said that that funding agreement will allow the national broadcaster continue to continue what it does best, to provide information and entertainment to Australians wherever they live. And in fact, David Anderson, the managing director of the ABC, welcomed the funding certainty that the announcement brings to the national broadcaster for the next three years. He said that the triennial funding announcement is an important recognition that the ABC is needed now more than ever and that this funding is required so that it can continue to fulfil its vital role in our democratic society. He even reached out and thanked Minister Paul Fletcher and the government for recognising the enduring value of the ABC, particularly in this year, as they mark 90 years of servicing and serving all Australians. Senator Griff, a second supplementary. Minister, journalists employed under the Enhanced News Gathering Program cannot be offered contracts which run beyond the funding period. That is a fact. As their employment and financial circumstances are precarious, the ABC struggles to attract and retain quality journalists in regional areas. What would the Minister say to these journalists to justify this policy of keeping it outside of the core budget? Minister. The ABC's funding is more certain than any other news gathering organisation in Australia, than any other Order. media organisation in Australia. And in fact, the News Media Bargaining Code, which of course passed the tr as, uh, this chamber on the 25th of February 2021, implemented that News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code, which has allowed the ABC to reach oh, an agreement. Sorry, Minister. Senator Griff, on a point of order. Uh, look, direct relevance. My question solely related to enhanced news gathering budget being, out, being outside of the core ABC budget. Uh, I, I'm listening to the minister's answer. I, I don't believe I can yet uh, bring her back to the question. You have uh, brought her back to part of the question, but minister, you have the call. You have 36 seconds remaining. Thank you, Mr President. And Senator Griff, what I wanted to say was that the new, the enhanced man mandatory bargaining code, sorry, the media and digital platforms mandatory bargaining code and the commercial agreements that have been now uh, negotiated between Google and Meta and the ABC have now allowed the ABC, and they have publicly committed to this, to use any of those funds from those agreements to support regional journal journalism specifically. And on the 5th of November 2021, the ABC unveiled plans for major investment in regional and rural broadcasting, regional and rural journalism, using those proceeds from its agreement with Google Minister, News Showcase. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals in government are securing our energy future including and especially in regional Australia. The minister representing the Minister for Industry. Order. Order. 
I will call the minister again, the minister representing the Minister for Industry, Senator Thank Sazelja. You. Thank you very much, Mr President. And we're already getting the interjections, which I love from Senator Watt. But these are the facts. These are the facts. Electricity costs are now at their lowest level in eight years. In the last two years alone, energy costs for households are down 8 per cent and costs for small businesses are down 10 per cent. Our reforms to cap the price of the highest cost electricity deals mean that a typical household can be up to $768 a year better off and a typical small business up to $3,000 a year better off. Now, on top of this, an AEMC report released in November shows household electricity bills across the national electricity market will continue to fall by a further nearly 6 per cent on average over the next few years. Now, that's in stark contrast to when that lot were in government, where we saw 23 consecutive quarters of increases in electricity pr prices. And now, now what do we see from those opposite? Labor are flip-flopping on the Curry Curry project in the Hunter. This project will provide 600 direct construction jobs, 1,200 indirect jobs for the Hunter region, Order. and now, after nearly a year of talking down jobs and investment in the Hunter, after nine Order. of his front bench colleagues opposed the project, the weak leader of the opposition, each way Albo, has backflipped on support for a new gas fired Minister. power station Minister. in Curry Curry. Minister. What a conviction politician he is. I have someone on their feet on a point of order, I believe. I I, I, I was g going to bring the minister's attention to the fact we do need to refer to members of the other place by their correct titles. Minister, you have the call. Conviction politician, the leader of the opposition is. Now, what do we think some senators over there think about this change of heart? Well, we know Senator Keneally and McAllister, they created Lean, the Labor Environmental Action Organisation, which said, we know increasing gas supply is not the solution. It's not good for the economy. It's not good for jobs and it's not good for the environment. So much support for Anthony Albanese and his new policy over there on the opposition benches. Senator McAllister, Senator Keneally and the entire front bench team. Minister, Nobody believes Minister, it. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you, Minister. Uh, you've mentioned the Curry Curry project in Hunter. Um, can you explain again for the benefit, particularly for the benefit of those opposite who may still be wavering despite <laughs> Labor's backflip, um, why that project, the Hunter Power project, is so important? Minister. Thank you, and, and yes, I can, because closing the Dell power plant without adequate replacement capacity risks prices rising by around 30 per cent over two years, which is what happened when they were last in government. That's why now, more than ever, it's important to see Curry Curry come online, a project that on this side we've consistently supported. But the Leader of the Opposition said the project doesn't stack, stack up. Senator McAllister said if you're interested in driving down electricity prices, you'd be mad to use gas. Chris Bowen said we don't support new gas-fired power stations like Curry Curry. Pat Conroy said it's a massive white elephant. Order. Mark Butler said we know that coal and gas won't underpin continued prosperity. And Mark Dreyfus said it's a project that no Order. one wants. That's what they really believe. That is what the Labor Party really believe. Forget about what they're saying now, Order. just before an election, in a desperate bid to curry favour uh, with those in the Hunter and elsewhere. They can't be trusted. We've got them in their own words. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Davey, a second supplementary. Thank oh. you. Finally, Senator Minister. Senator Davey, hold on. Let's just have some quiet before you start the question. It's a really good question. Okay, Everyone Senator agree. Davey, you have the call. Thank you. Can the minister outline what the risks are to the continued delivery of affordable and reliable energy? for all Australian families and all Australian small and to medium businesses? Minister. Well, well I can. Uh, and of course, it's, it's those opposite in potential coalition with the Greens. Uh, in coalition with the Greens. And here in the ACT, uh, we've had a bit of a look at what that looks like, a Labor-Greens coalition. And Anthony Albanese and Adam Vant want to take that project Order. national. That's what they want to do. They want to take it national. And what have we seen here? Well, electricity prices in the rest of the country, they're going down. What we're seeing in the ACT, 
is they're projected to go up by 4 per cent on the back of a 12 per cent increase just last year. And of course, if Anthony Albanese is going to cave to the Greens on, uh, pol oh, on no. energy policy, Minister. On it, they really don't like me talking about their Labor Greens alliance. All right. Yep, Minister, I've just seated the Minister. Senator Billick. Once again, Mr. President, I will draw your attention to the fact that um, the Speaker is not referring to the gentleman he's referring to by the right title or name. I will ask all or everyone uh, to remember that we address members of the other place by their correct titles. Minister, you have the call. And so, if the Leader of the Opposition is going to cave to the Greens on energy, what else is he going to give the Greens, we ask? Is he going to cave to them on their policy to cut defence spending in half? Is he going to cave to their policies to decriminalise hard drugs like ICE? He will cave to them on anything to get in government, and that's why he can't Minister, be trusted. your time has expired. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs. In my home state of Victoria, people who sought the help of this country are being imprisoned in the Park Hotel. How can you justify locking these innocent people up for up to nine years, where the vast majority of them have been recognised as refugees. The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Thorpe for the question. Uh, Senator Thorpe, there is one thing that the Australian Greens and uh, the Morrison-Joyce government disagree about, and that is in relation to the fundamental policy of border protection. Uh, you joined last time with the Labor Party, and as a result, the people that you are referring to in the alternative places of detention, um, they came to this country and they came here in contravention of our strong border protection laws. Order. I reject any statement by you that in any way infers that they are locked up. We have made it very, very clear Order. as a government that the fundamental responsibility of a government is the protection of Australia and Australians. And Mr President, the question asked by Senator Thorpe is a very, very telling one. A very, very telling one, because what it says is this to the Australian people. If at the next election they were to cast a vote, as Senator Cecilia has said, for the Australian Labor Party, they will be going in, in concert, just like they did last time, with the Australian Greens. 50,000 people coming to this country illegally. The thousands of deaths, Senator Thorpe, of people at sea. We make no apologies on this side of the chamber, Mr President, for our tough border protection principles. A fundamental responsibility of any Commonwealth government must be, must be the protection of Australia and Australians. And on that regard, both the Australian Greens Order. and the Australian Labor Party, they fail every time. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Order. President. Uh, sorry, Senator Thorpe, that wasn't directed at you. That was directed at others. You Thank have the call for your supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Minister, for your response. The only people who came here illegally uh, were the people that came here 240 years on the boats. So, last month, the Prime Minister claimed that the people held in the Park Hotel are not refugees. Why did the Prime Minister lie about this? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And Senator Thorpe, I completely, totally and utterly reject the statement that you have made that the Prime Minister has lied. There is one thing that you can say about well, there are many things that you can say about the Prime Minister, but this is Order. a man who is responsible Order. for when the Minister for Immigration some of the strongest border protection policies this country will ever see. And Mr President, as we move towards the next election, which as we know is in but a few months, 
Again, this question highlights the fundamental difference, the fundamental difference for all Australians of the attitude of the Australian Greens in coalition with the Australian Labor Party and the attitude of the coalition Order. government. Again, we will never make excuses for protecting Australia and Australians. Senator Thorpe, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister, for your uh, response. Again, the only people who came here legally were the people who came here 240 years ago on boats. What is the plan to release the remaining people who are being locked up and tortured at the Park Hotel prison? Minister. Mr President, I don't think there is a lot more that I can actually add to my answers because, again, Senator Thorpe, you actually show your disrespect for border protection policy in Australia by those comments. Governments are not torturing people and any allegation that they are, as you know, is completely, totally Order. and utterly untrue. Order. Senator Patrick. Don't agree with torture. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate. I first called on the Government to consider the establishment of a Royal Commission inquiry into Australia's COVID-19 pandemic response more than seven months ago. Would you agree, now agree that it's imperative that a fully independent national inquiry able to identify all lessons to be learned and able to deliver authoritative findings to, give, uh, to guide, guide future policy is required? Will the government, uh, before the uh, pre-election caretaker period, commit to establishing a wide-ranging Royal Commission inquiry, fully empowered under the Royal Commission Act, to inquire into federal, state and territory government responses to the pandemic so that investigations can get underway by the middle of the year. If the government's not prepared to do, uh, do that now, will you uh, commit to doing so after the election, if you get into power? The Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. And I thank, uh, thank Senator Patrick for his question and Senator Abetz for his interjection before. Um, uh, Mr, uh, Mr President, um, the government continues, as, uh, as we've acknowledged along the way, to manage uh, the complicated responses to uh, COVID-19. Uh, and those responses are complicated by the fact that it continues to be uh, an evolving and changing situation. Uh, had, uh, indeed, for uh, example, a Royal Commission of the nature that Senator Patrick proposes delivered interim reports and findings ahead of the Omicron variant uh, becoming established and becoming the dominant variant, um, it would probably have different recommendations at that stage to what it would have today, because that is the nature of the changing circumstance we face in handling uh, a pandemic. And there will probably be uh, other changes to come. Uh, we have certainly subjected ourselves to review and scrutiny throughout our responses to the pandemic, uh, the, chair, the committee that Senator Gallagher chairs uh, being an important vehicle of that, along with the fact that, uh, that all of the other mechanisms of scrutiny have continued to be in place. Uh, I have no doubt that, uh, that there will be um, reviews uh, when we are able to put uh, the pandemic more squarely in the rearview mirror uh, and, uh, and that those reviews will need to entail a cooperative approach between the Commonwealth states and territories uh, around how we best prepare ourselves for future uncertainty and future disasters. But I would underline, um, Senator Patrick, the word uncertainty uh, in that regard, that, uh, that the next major global disruption uh, we face um, will almost unquestionably not be like the current one, and that, uh, that whilst there are lessons that we should continue to learn from this, I don't think anybody should pretend that a Royal Commission or any other particular inquiry will be a panacea uh, to answer Minister, all questions for the future. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary thank, question. Thank you. I'll take that as a no. Um, would you agree that any future inquiries into the government's COVID-19 pandemic response, whether it be a Royal Commission or other forms of inquiry, will require full unrestricted access 
to the records of the Commonwealth, of Commonwealth departments and agencies. Accordingly, will the government direct the Director General of Archives to immediately issue, under the Archives Act, a records retention notice to all departments and agencies prohibiting them fr uh, from de de destroying Commonwealth records or hard copies of documents relating to the COVID-19 pandemic? Sorry, Minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, whilst uh, whilst I don't uh, pretend to be an expert on the legalities of the uh, of the Archives Act and the obligations that exist across Commonwealth agencies, uh, I am fairly confident to say uh, that they are not destroying uh, records or documents that uh, that would be uh, appropriately considered under any uh, future review or other arrangements. If there's a need to uh, add to that in terms of the uh, request you have made or the suggestion you have made, Senator Patrick, about an explicit um, order uh, being made and, uh, and whether that would provide any uh, additional uh, protection in, uh, in that regard. I'll bring further information to the Chamber if that is necessary. Um, uh, in, uh, in terms of cooperation, if, uh, if an inquiry uh, is established, and as I said, I expect there will be not only plenty of reviews, but uh, obviously there will be many academic studies focusing on particular areas, all different areas of response to, or to the pandemic over the years to come, and certainly where there are reviews of government, we will cooperate for. Minister. Thank you, Minister. Senator Patrick, a second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr President. After three years, the government has failed to deliver a promised anti, uh, Federal Anti-Corruption Commission. What current guarantees can you give that, that if re-elected, that you won't continue to duck scrutiny and accountability for the failures of the government's COVID-19 response, for the failure of border control and quarantine, the vaccine stroll out, the rats test kit shambles and the continuing tragedy in our aged care homes? Aren't those failures the reason why you won't support a Royal Commission? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. Pre Mr President. Well, I, I completely reject uh, the many assertions that Senator Patrick has uh, made in his question. Uh, if we were to have uh, the type of fair income independent inquiry that, uh, that Senator Patrick uh, wants to speak of and it were to do a global comparison, I am confident it would find that in Australia uh, the fatality rates are some of the lowest in the world. The vaccination rates are some of the highest in the world. The employment outcomes and business security and safety and survival rates are some of the best in the world. Now, Mr. Mr President, as I have acknowledged, the Prime Minister has acknowledged, as Senator Colbeck and Minister Hunt have acknowledged, have we got absolutely everything right in a period of enormous global Order. uncertainty? No, we don't pretend that we have. Uh, and those, uh, those uh, rearview mirror experts opposite, who, uh, who are experts in hindsight, uh, who of course Order. pretend uh, that, uh, that they would have got everything right, there's no chance that, uh, that they would have, nor has any other government around the world, got everything right. But we have done Minister. very well in Australia relative Minister. to many other countries, and we continue Minister. to respond Your as comprehensively as we can to. Minister. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. In March last year, a report from this minister's own aged care regulator warned that the Jeddah Gardens nursing home was not prepared for a COVID-19 outbreak and, I quote, had not minimised infection-related risks as it had not effectively planned or prepared for a potential outbreak of COVID-19. What action did this minister take in response? Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and, uh, the government, through the regulator, uh, issued some, a number of notices to uh, the provider and continued to work with the provider and uh, a number of follow-up visits to ensure that the provider did bring its response up to an appropriate level of standard. It took regulatory action, Mr President, uh, in, uh, in September. Um, it took, put a non-compliance in notice in, in, in October uh, and on the 29th of November put a uh, notice to remedy, Mr President. So the Quality and Safety Commission actually undertook its role, which is continue to provide oversight to the provider, Mr President, to, in, to, to, to bring it 
the, the service back to compliance, Mr. President. And it Order. continues to do that, Mr. President. And it continues to do that. That is the role that the Quality and Safety Commission has, Mr. President. It, it has that independent legislative responsibility that the Labor Party voted for uh, to provide that level Order. of oversight to a provider and take appropriate compliance action to bring a service back into compliance, Mr. President. And of course, the government can, has provided significant additional resources to the Quality and Safety Order. Commission to ensure that they have the capacity to do that, Mr. President. And that's what we will continue to do. We'll continue to work to improve the structure of the system, the resources of the system, particularly the Quality and Safety Commission, so that they can provide the relevant and appropriate oversight to the sector to ensure that all providers, all providers, Mr. President, are in compliance. And Mr. President, I will say this to any provider out there. Be prepared for the fact that even though there is a pandemic on, the, the Quality and Safety Commission will continue to be focused on its work as it appropriately should. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The minister claims that Jetta Gardens was brought back to compliance, but yesterday reports emerged that chronic staff shortages at Jetta Gardens have forced 90-year-old residents to care for each other, that families were lied to about vaccinations and not informed their loved ones had COVID until they were dying, and that staff were asked to only change masks if you need to due to mask shortages. How could the minister fail Jetta Gardens residents so badly when he was twice warned that their safety was at risk? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I've Thank you, Mr. Order. President, uh, and I too have seen those, re those reports. And Mr. President, that's why, uh, that is why, Mr. President, additional quality uh, regulatory action has been taken against the, uh, the provider, including uh, a notice to agree, which has required additional capacity to be uh, employed by the facility to ensure that it is providing uh, services to the residents there in accordance with. The, Order. in accordance with the quality standards, Mr President. That is the role of the system. That is the role of the Quality and Safety Commissioner, and that's what the Commission has Senator done, Watt. Mr President. Mr President, uh, I have to say I, like so many others, Mr President, uh, am extremely disappointed in Senator the non-compliance of this Keneally. service, Mr President. They need to retake responsibility for their role as an approved provider, Order. Mr. President, and I will ensure I will ensure that the Quality Commission Minister, does its role Minister, as an oversight. Your time has expired, Senator Watt. A second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. With 15 Jetta Gardens residents now tragically dead from COVID-19, after this minister was twice warned their safety was at risk, and 182 residents and staff infected with COVID. Does the minister still seriously believe the aged care system is not in crisis? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as I've said a number of times this week, the, sector in, the aged care sector in Australia, due to COVID-19, due to a global pandemic, is under severe stress. Order. Is under severe stress. And, and nobody, nobody, Mr President, nobody present, Mr. President has tried to, to deny that, Mr President. Uh, and we have... We have provided Senator every Watt. single resource that we possibly can. And Mr President, I know that different people and I'm not here to play word bingo with the Labor Party. I'm here to work with, with uh, the aged care sector Order. to resolve the issues and to assist them to work their way through the pandemic. While we work on the pandemic, Mr President, the Labor Party play politics with the pandemic. That's what Order. they do. They, they are playing politics with the pandemic and we are actively in action. Uh, in working on assisting the sector to get it, to, to work its way through the pandemic, providing them with the resources, whether it's surge workforce, whether it's PPE, whether it's rapid antigen tests, all of those things, Mr. President, to support the sector to get through the pandemic. Minister. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government's plan is securing Australia's pipeline of skilled workers now and into the future? The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan uh, for his question. I mean, in particular, I acknowledge all the work that he did prior to becoming a senator uh, in relation to ensuring that Australians are upskilled, and in particular, 
in our home state of Western Australia. Uh, Mr President, the Morrison-Joyce government, without our doubt, is a job-creating government. Uh, since we were elected in 2013, Order. over 1.7 million jobs have now been created. For context, we actually have had a population the size of South Australia, the size of South Australia, move into work over the last nine years. That is a great thing for the Australian people. The unemployment level, as we know, now sits at 4.2 per cent. It is now lower than when Labor was last in office. And of course, Getting Australians into jobs is the focus of our policies when it comes to recovering from COVID-19. And Senator Rose Sullivan, as you know, one of those focuses is investing in vocational education and training. Mr. President, our investment in skills and training commenced when we were elected to office in 2013. It is now at record levels in Australia. In the past two years, the coalition government has invested around $12 billion into the skills and training system, and this year alone we're expecting a record $7.1 billion investment. And as we know, Mr President, as we move towards the election, it's important to remind ourselves what Labor did to vocational education and training when they were last in office. Because if you recall, they totally destroyed the reputation Order. of the VET sector. Colleagues, who can forget Labor's disastrous vet fee help system? Signing up students to courses that didn't exist and now costing the Australian taxpayer $2 billion in recrediting. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Mr President, I thank the Minister for that answer. How has the government's plan for schools helped businesses take on more apprentices and to keep them on? Minister. Mr President, a number of the policies that we have put in place throughout COVID-19 have well and truly assisted businesses not just to take on more apprentices but to keep those apprentices that they have taken on. In terms of our boosting apprenticeship commencement wage subsidy, it has been an overwhelming success. The wage subsidy has put almost 277,000 Australians into an apprenticeship or traineeship. And that's in over 82,000 businesses. Mr President, for those 277,000 Australians, what a fantastic step up for them into their new job. And of course, for those 82,000 businesses, to have that government investment in those apprentices and trainees has well and truly been reflected in the fact that the 277,000 are now in apprenticeships or traineeships. And Mr President, during uh, the pandemic, about 38 per cent of businesses have increased the number of apprentices Minister, that they have. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government working with states and territories to address their unique challenges in skills demand? Minister. Mr President, throughout COVID-19, we have worked with the states and territories, and in particular in relation to the skilled workforce and delivering the skilled workforce that Australia needs. Uh, you will recall uh, that we set up the Job Trainer Fund. This was a joint uh, lift funded between the states and the territories and the Commonwealth Government. It was a $2 billion job trainer program supporting over 400,000 free or low-cost training places in areas of demand. And, Mr President, the key here was working with the states and territories to ensure that the investment that we were making together properly reflected the demand in the workplace. So the courses that you see that are offered by the individual states and territories, when people sign up to those free or low-cost courses, they know that the Morrison-Joyce government is supporting them into being upskilled in an area in which the labour market is saying you will get a job. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. I'll give senators a moment to clear the room before we move to taking. No, oh, sorry, Senator Wish Wilson. and aged care for an explanation as to why an answer has not been provided to question on notice number 86 asked during the 2021-22 supplementary budget estimates hearings of the Community Affairs Committee, the question related to the health-based guidance for PFAS chemicals. 
Minister. Oh, just a moment, Minister. I don't leave your microphones on. Just try again. Again, I don't think. Yeah. Mic Thank you, Deputy President. Um, Senator, I don't have any specific advice in relation to that, but I do commit to coming back to you as quickly as possible in relation to the answer. I'm aware that you were going to ask uh, this information. I had sought advice from the okay. minister's office. I'll go back and uh, see what I can resolve yeah, as quickly as possible for you. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the explanation. Um, Thank you for that, Senator Colbeck. But yes, we did contact your office to give you a heads up that this was coming, and uh, we have tried to do so multiple times. Um, this issue is very important, uh, Deputy President. Um, PFAS chemicals are in getting increasing focus uh, around the world uh, for their impact on health, uh, on agriculture, uh, and on soil contamination right across uh, airports and other sites in the country. and Sadly, they're making their way into our rivers uh, and into our waterways. Um, and the PFAS group of chemicals represent over 4,000 chemicals. We've been using them historically in a wide range of applications, but unfortunately they have many harmful effects. And their use in products such as firefighting foam has led them to entering the water supply and our food stream. Um, they're a major environmental problem that's being recognised all around the world. Um, they don't break down naturally and they can be potentially highly toxic to a range of animals, uh, habitat and ecosystems. Uh, now, Many countries uh, have discontinued their use. Um, and What interests me is that while Commonwealth advice states that PFAS have not been proven to cause specific illnesses in humans, uh, other nations now are increasingly disagreeing. Notably, the United States EPA has stated that there is evidence that the exposure to PFAS can lead to adverse health outcomes in humans, um, and that the US EPA uh, only last month uh, has started a mo water monitoring program testing for PFAS around the nation. Uh, they've also released an epide epidemiological study of 69,000 people related to PFAS contamination. Uh, that has shown uh, kidney disease and testicular cancer. Um, in Michigan, uh, PFAS was found in beef after cattle were fed crops grown with fertiliser made from contaminated wastewater uh, biosolids. Uh, farms in Maine and New Mexico, including dairy operations, were forced to close after high levels of PFAS. Now, we're not immune to this kind of contamination. Just in my home state of Launceston, and this is particularly why I am actually pursuing this line of questioning with the minister, uh, we have publicly acknowledged PFAS contamination from Launceston Airport uh, in farmlands and in rivers, uh, including rivers that go through the town that are used for fishing, that are used for recreation, uh, and we still haven't got any answers from the minister. We've also seen Germany, Denmark, the Netherlands, Norway and Sweden have signalled their intention to ban their manufacture of PFAS. Um, and they have provided guidance for uh, PFAS in drinking water, um, which are very different to the Australian guidance, hence my questions to the minister. Um, I note that there was one thing that the Greens asked the minister to provide, um, and a new epidemiological study that has just been released by ANU, uh, which, is, which is a positive. Now, just very briefly, the questions that we, we put to the minister, how often is the health-based guidance values for PFAS fact sheets? Uh, as available on the pfas.gov.au website updated, and when was the last time it was updated? No answer. The last date update about PFAS in the Australian water drinking guidelines was in 2018, four years ago. Yet we see continued evidence growing about the health impacts of PFAS. Not good enough. When is the next update on PFAS envisaged? No answer. Why has there been no update since 2018? No answer. What priority areas, priority areas have been identified for PFAS health research by the Australian government since 2018? No answer. How much money has the Australian government invested in PFAS health research since 2018? No answer. How has the Australian government adapted its health advice considering the recent changes to guidance in the EU and US? No answer. Um, now, of course, we have asked these questions previously at estimates. Uh, no answer on the night, so we put Thank questions you. on notice, and still 
uh, way beyond uh, the due date. We have received no answers from the minister. Um, may I say, uh, Deputy President, to conclude, look, I understand Senator Colbeck has been under a lot of pressure lately. Um, yes, see, it is a very serious thing when this chamber, uh, when the opposition calls for the resignation of a minister. It is only something I have seen uh, less than a handful of times in my 10 years in this place. And I remember a day when it was actually an extremely serious thing for all of us to call for the resignation of a minister. But we have seen repeated failures by Senator Colbeck in his department. Um, and I was gobsmacked when I learnt that he did not appear before the Senate committee to provide not only information to the committee at a crucial time, but information that could have been of comfort to senior Australians who were really doing it tough during COVID, many of them alone, many of them anxious, many of them suffering and, sadly, too many of them dying from this virus. And the minister goes to the cricket. Well, perhaps that's why he can't provide or hasn't been able to put a rocket under the department to get answers for us today, even after we have repeatedly reached out and asked for those answers today. It's simply not acceptable. Uh, and I hope the minister can get a hurry on because, as is plainly obvious, we have very limited parliamentary time this year to get the answers to these critical questions. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wish Wilson uh, to take note of answers to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Understanding Order 745A, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, as to why 2020 and to 2021 additional estimates, questions on notice numbers 1356, 501 and 519 to 531, inclusive, placed on the notice paper through the Finance and Public Administration Committee in the PM and C portfolio, remain unanswered. Minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Gallagher, for uh, for her question. Um, as I've observed a few times in uh, in the life of, uh, of this Parliament over the last year, uh, there've been um, not dozens, not hundreds, not thousands, but tens of thousands of questions that of questions that have filtered through um, and the parliamentary proceedings of uh, this chamber, the other chamber, uh, of estimates committees, of different uh, select and standing committees uh, that uh, that the government has received. Uh, and overwhelmingly that the government has worked through uh, responses to. Um, uh, I acknowledge that, uh, that uh, with uh, what is uh, a flow of questions um, that is, uh, is um, uh, more, not just more than was received in the last parliament, uh, but as I understand more than was received in the previous couple of parliaments combined, um, you know, there are challenges in working through all of them. Um, some questions uh, come with additional sensitivities, including in some cases legal sensitivities, uh, to, uh, to be worked through, um, and sometimes that adds time to, uh, to the responses there. So uh, whilst I am sure, as is relatively predictable in these debates, that, uh, that a raft of criticisms will follow about the timeliness of responses to questions and, uh, and so on, Deputy President, uh, I, would, uh, I would note and contend uh, that in terms of the government's responsiveness to the sheer volume of questions and accountability by responding uh, to such large numbers of questions. We have demonstrated uh, a very strong and significant effort uh, in, uh, in our accountability uh, through the, uh, the term of this parliament um, and will, of course, continue to make best endeavours in relation to the many questions that, uh, that we continue uh, to, uh, to receive on a regular basis. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Um, understanding Order 745B, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation from the Minister. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you. And the Minister is absolutely right that there will be criticism of the government's failure to answer these questions. These are important questions, and it seems to be, and the defence from the Minister for Finance is the same defence that he used in December when I asked the, when I followed up the failure to answer these questions, which is essentially that a lot of questions have been asked, um, and therefore that's why a lot of questions remain unanswered. That is essentially the government's uh, defence. Well, on this day of all days, when Ms. Brittany Higgins has addressed the nation, um, again has, has spoken about her experience here, 
These questions relate to that. They, they date back to questions that I asked and are now 278 days overdue. It's not like I've been harassing the government to answer these. They were, ex they were expected to be answered by the 7th of May, I think, in 2021. That was the due date. We've now 278 days overdue. We have had two estimates rounds in the intervening period. I have written to the Secretary of Prime Minister and Cabinet on the 13th of October last year asking where the answers to these questions are and, and indeed whether they're giving him the opportunity to say whether there are specific reasons why these questions can't be answered, if, if that is an additional defence by the government. And Secretary Gaitchens has, hasn't even bothered to answer. I mean, who would have thought that the head of the Prime Minister's department, the central agency, refuses to even acknowledge, let alone reply, to a letter, a polite letter asking where the answers uh, to these questions might be. But that's the state of the level of accountability and transparency that exists in this government. I would argue the lowest level of accountability and transparency. They may have answered questions, they may have been asked lots of questions, but I can tell you if they were a little more open and transparent and provided a little bit more information and didn't fight and withhold so much information, maybe there would be fewer questions asked. And maybe if they answered questions and not used um, the opportunity to answer as merely a way to fob people off, I have so many questions where the answers provided by this government don't even bother to, to answer the question. Like, you know, can you provide this? Can you provide A? The answer will be, here's an orange. You know, like that is the quality that we get. And that is the disrespect that is shown uh, to this Senate. And when I look back, these are the questions that were asked. And, and Ms Higgins, I didn't get the opportunity to go to the press club today, of which I'm deeply um, sorry. Uh, I would have liked to have been there, but um, I, I caught a little bit on the TV and I, I heard Ms Higgins say that she was still confronted by the fact uh, it's linked to the, the text message that we all know exists where, where the Deputy Prime Minister messaged uh, through a third party, Ms Higgins, to basically say he thought the Prime Minister was a liar and a hypocrite. And she alluded to that to being about his state of knowledge of what had happened to her and how that had kind of been brushed over in the hoo-ha over the text message, that the substance of what was being hidden there or, or not acknowledged was that the Deputy Prime Minister seems to be agreeing that the Prime Minister knew more than he was letting on. And my questions, which are now 278 days overdue, go to that point. Remember the Gaitchens inquiry that got started up when the Prime Minister couldn't go and ask his staff who knew what and when? Uh, he had to create an inquiry, a specific inquiry, and then after the heat moved on, remember that inquiry just got suspended and then nobody talked about it anymore. Well, nobody's heard anything back from that. I have questions around what the Prime Minister knew about Brittany Higgins' alleged rape in this building and when. I had questions about the relocation of Ms Higgins to a different office after her disclosure. I had questions about the Gaitchens' inquiry into who knew what when in the Prime Minister's office. Whether, for example, Mr Gaitchens could tell us how many interviews he's done and how they were conducted. About media inquiries leading up to the breaking of Ms Higgins' story and who was involved with handling them and what were they told. Questions about whether or not the Prime Minister's staff backgrounded journalists against Ms Higgins' partner. 
about the contact between the Prime Minister's principal private secretary and Ms Higgins following the airing of the Four Corners inside the Canberra bubble story. And there were also questions about correspondence with the Federal Police Commissioner, contact between Ms Minister Dutton and the Prime Minister's office, the departure of the alleged perpetrator and slurs ba made by Minister Reynolds about Ms Higgins. Now, I can see why the government doesn't want to answer these questions. I get that. But to just not provide any answer or any explanation is, is just not acceptable. It treats the Senate with contempt. It makes a mockery of the conventions of this place and the powers of the Senate to hold governments to account, to scrutinise the workings of government. And there is no consequence for this. Like It's easier for the government to not answer at all. It's easier for Secretary Gaitchens to ignore a letter from a senator pursuing his department about their failure to answer questions asked at estimates about a year ago now. It is easier and more beneficial to the government to act in this way than it is to answer them. And that's the sorry state of how this government treats this chamber. You know, the minister says there's plenty of avenues available for accountability and transparency. Yeah, but it does require the government to play their part, which is to provide information or, if they refuse to answer, to provide an explanation. And this, the issues that are raised in my questions go, go straight to the fundamentals of the standard of this government and the standard that the Prime Minister sets in leading it. Because I presume he's okay with these questions not being answered. You know, I presume Secretary Gaitchens isn't going to get a call from the PMO today and say, oh, I've just been listening into the, um, the chamber that deals with accountability and transparency and they're saying that you, well, you haven't answered something for nearly a year now, you better get on to that. I doubt that's going to happen because that's, that is the culture of this government. It's to hide things, it's to sweep things under the carpet, it's to delay, it's to distract, it's to pretend, and at times it's to not tell the truth. I mean, that's the reality. We've all been learning that over the past few months. When the Prime Minister's closest colleagues and world leaders bell the cat and tell tell us all what he's really like. And here is it, just another example of it. You know, I get that governments don't, are busy. I completely accept that. And I accept they have a lot on their plate at times. At the moment, they've got more than they probably need, much of it self-inflicted. But that doesn't take away the responsibility a government has to protect and uphold the conventions of the parliament. And that is what's been let go here. And the Senate hasn't really shown its capability or capacity to stand up and push back against that. Oh, I think that's deeply regrettable, uh, but it's subject uh, for another day. But these questions are important. They're important for us to understand what happened in this place. We're all talking about how we want to make this place a better place. And in fact, yesterday, the Prime Minister said, I want this building to be a place where young Australians and young women in particular can follow their dreams and live out their beliefs and not have them crushed by brutally, brutality and the misuse of power. That's the quote from yesterday. Well, part of living up to that, surely, is to fess up to what happened in this building when Ms Higgins' alleged rape occurred and the, t the period after that. And this time last year, when the government was on the back foot and was trying to deal with the fallout of Ms Higgins going public. 
That is what these questions are about. 18 questions that day after day, week after week, month after month and soon to be year, the government ignores and fails to answer. And as I said, we, know, we understand completely why it's the government's preference to do that, but it is disrespectful. It is disrespectful to Ms Higgins. It flies in the face of the work that we're all trying to do around the Jenkins inquiry, because what it says is it's easier not to answer these, to not front up to what happened, to not be honest about who knew what when and what was done and whether nothing was done. Ms Higgins certainly feels that her treatment following her disclosures to Ms uh, Minister Reynolds and others that she was treated poorly. Well, the government has the opportunity to answer these questions and put up their side of the story. Today's defence by the um, Minister for Finance and, you know, I know Minister Birmingham, he's a dec fundamentally decent person and I, you know, as you stand up and give your explanation, you know, there's a part of me that thinks it shouldn't be you doing this, it should be the Prime Minister answering for this. But it's, it's insincere and disrespectful to say, well, there's a lot of questions and therefore we've answered some and not others, and for us to presume that the 18 questions asked about Ms Higgins and her experience here and what happened here at the heart of the government um, can just be ignored, hopefully for the duration of this term, and then they lapse. That's the sorry state that we're in. The government's failed to provide an adequate explanation. I hope that uh, Secretary Gaitchens is listening and perhaps he could be bothered, you know, considering the big bucks that are going on over there in PM and C, to actually respond to my letter of October and explain why those questions aren't being answered, or perhaps he has a resource issue, I don't know, he could tell me, or if they are going to be answered, answer them prior to PM and C appearing at estimates uh, next Monday, where we will be pursuing uh, this matter. I think at a minimum, Secretary Gaitchens uh, could be bothered doing that. It would be appreciated. And any, um, any mode or push that um, Minister Birmingham could provide to that department to do the job that they are resourced to do uh, would be appreciated as well. But it is a really sorry state, I have to say, that we stand here using the precious time of the Senate uh, to explain why questions that were asked 258 days ago still need to be followed up. It sh this place should be afforded more decency and respect by the government. Thank you. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to taking note. Senator Billett. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator, by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Keneally and Gallagher earlier today. We know that aged care, the aged care sector is in crisis. It is a word that we can't get the minister to, to say. Uh, in fact, in question time today, he said it was in severe stress. It's worse than severe stress. It is crisis. And I've got to say, I despair of the minister and his ability to be able to deal with the ongoing issues. He's completely mismanaged and shown his incompetence by his actions in regard to the aged care crisis that the sector is facing. In fact, He's completely stuffed it, to be honest. It's four key areas that, are, you know, that concern this side of the chamber. Obviously, boosters, the lack of PPE, people be get, be, being sent the wrong PPE um, when they've asked for PPE, PPEs. The rats, well, we know they couldn't give a rat, so you know, that's not new to anybody. And the surge workforce. 
And we've got the aged care workers who are so overworked and underpaid that, as we heard earlier today in question time, they're working 80 hours a week. A lot of them are working 80 hours a week. That's not sustainable. This industry, although I haven't worked in it, I know from my friends who actually work in it, is a very physical industry. It's also emotionally challenging for the workforce. You know, they're not just dealing with people that might pop along to a surgery and have a little sniffle. They've got to lift people, they've got to turn people, they have to deal with people with mental health issues, with dementia, with all sorts of issues. Some of those people have been basically locked up for weeks and weeks and weeks on end and not being able to see their families. People having to die without their families present. And what have we got? We've got lip service from the government that really, as I said, um, humour aside, could not give a rats. They could not give a rats. And these workers, they deserve our respect. And what else they deserve is a decent pay for what they do. A lot of them are only earning $22 an hour. You can earn more being a gardener. You can earn more being a cleaner in someone's home. It's atrocious that we are treating people that look, are looking after one of the most vulnerable people in our um, society, that they're underpaid, that they're being treated like rubbish by this government, no care whatsoever. And then we wonder, well, we don't on this side, we know why, wonder why it's hard to retain workers in the industry. As I said, even before you consider the pressures brought about by the industry. Our aged care workers, and I want to say this off the front, have been doing amazing work, amazing work under such difficult conditions. And they are the heroes of this pandemic. And just as they are the heroes, the villain is Minister Colbeck. Minister Colbeck, who decided that it was better to go to three days at the cricket than to deal with the issues facing the aged care crisis, than to attend a Senate inquiry or a joint inquiry into um, COVID. This is despite the fact that the committee had said to him, we will meet at a day and time at your convenience. And you know what? They only wanted two hours and 45 minutes of his time. But no, Senator Colbeck, Minister Colbeck could not give that two minutes and 45. Because why? Because <coughs> Minister Colbeck was at the cricket enjoying hospitality. I mean, seriously, they could have found him a room over there. I know what the cricket ground's like. I live in Hobart. I've been over there. They could have found him a nice, quiet little room. He could have set up. He could have done it. But he didn't want to, and that's because he's embarrassed, as he should be. He should be hanging his head in shame about the treatment all through COVID of the aged care sector. I'll tell you, I'm surprised he even turns up because, truly, more front than mire to turn up and say the, the, the um, sector is under severe stress. It's worse than severe stress. It's in crisis. And we've Thank got a you, minister. Senator Billick, your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Deputy President, these questions go to aged care and uh, I think it's uh, quite fair actually for me to say that Labor's record on this issue of aged care is actually patchy at best, patchy at best. Their record on health overall is in fact very poor. We only need to look back at their history when they were in government to, to see that. Uh, so far be it from uh, from them to, to come into this place and, and lecture us, lecture this government who have uh, done a remarkable job in particular in collaboration with the states over the last two years to uh, weather and deal with the uh, issues of health related to the pandemic and of course uh, I, even, you know, I could go on about the, the, uh, the way the economy is, is tracking in Australia right now compared to the rest of the world but on health we are uh, we are arguably in the most enviable position of anywhere else on the planet uh, in regards to that. Now, a lot of uh, senior Australians uh, were impacted 
by the failures uh, of, of Labor to uh, continue to support uh, their, their lack of failure to continue to support the, the PBS, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. Well, we on this side of government have listed a record number of drugs on the PBS, supporting all Australians, and in particular, of course, we know that in particular older Australians have uh, a greater need for, for drugs that are listed on the PBS. And it's our management of the economy, keeping uh, the economy strong and have a, a balanced budget or a budget that's able to support the uh, listing of these medicines on there, that has meant that older Australians, in particular, have been very well supported. Uh, since 2013, the Coalition has approved nearly 3,000 new or amended listings on the PBS. This represents an average of around 30 listings or amendments per month, or one each day, an overall investment by the government of $14 billion. Now we do acknowledge, we do acknowledge that there are issues in the aged care sector, and that's why, uh, in particular, right now we've provided uh, 80,000 shifts of surge workforce around Australia. Uh, we've not spared any expense to support the sector, and that's why we've recognised the sector with special payments, the $800 bonus payment. Now I just want to pay tribute to those that are working in the aged care sector. Now, I've, uh, I've been surrounded by uh, family that have worked in this space. My grandmother, she's now retired, uh, one of the most special persons in my life. Uh, she worked in the aged care sector for pretty much her entire career. My sister uh, works in the aged care sector. She's a nurse, registered nurse there in a, in a wonderful uh, um, uh, facility in the south of Perth. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, aged care workers are some of the most dedicated uh, people, they do the job because they love the job. We acknowledge that uh, you know, they're not the highest paid occupations uh, and they turn up every day because they care about their job, they care about the people that they're serving and they really do make a difference. And I know they're, they're rewarded by uh, the fact that they're doing wonderful, wonderful work. But we recognise that they have been under-challenged uh, over this last uh, period and uh, the government in, in recognising that and or importantly helping those employers, uh, the service providers, to uh, retain staff, uh, having gone through the fatigue of dealing with uh, uh, particularly the pandemic, uh, it's important that they're able to retain as many staff members as they can. Uh, this $800 bonus payment uh, spread across a couple of payments is, is, uh, is aimed at, at really helping them to address that. Now, uh, it's interesting, there were questions that went to uh, wages, and uh, uh, the, the Labor Party, at least here in the Senate, uh, they, they probably need to just check their notes with what gets said in, in the other place, because uh, uh, Minister Albanese actually, said, uh, actually says that uh, he supports the process of going through the Fair Work Commission, because that's the commission that they set up, that Labor actually set up, it's under that framework that we now have this position where uh, it's an independent process. Now, Anthony Albanese, the, 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 the leader of the opposition, has not provided any, co any uh, amount that he'll go to in, uh, if he was leader of the government. Uh, he hasn't said what it would cost. He hasn't said what impact he would make. Why is that? Because he's just all about politics. He's all just about presenting a political narrative rather than actually addressing the issue. If he named a price, then he'd have to cost it. But he doesn't want to do that ahead of election Thank because you, his Senator cost O'Sullivan. things are Your always time unfunded. Has expired. Senator Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. The aged care sector is in crisis. It is. That is clear for everyone to see. It's clear when you talk to aged care workers, as I have, as I know all my colleagues have, but even if you haven't been bothered to go talk to the workforce and understand what's happening on the ground in their workplaces at the moment, a quick scan of the news headlines will show you the state the sector's in. The number of people dying will show you that the sector is in crisis. The reports of workers under stress and under strain, the choices they are being forced to make every single day when they go into their workplace, about which of the residents in their care who need their urgent attention they tend to. These reports are not hard to find. In fact, you've heard them today in question time. 
You can look at the rollout of boosters, see the significant and critical shortages of jabs in arms, jabs which keep people safe. It is not hard to see that this is a sector in crisis. It is not hard. And indeed, if you are willing to spend the time playing the word games to prove that it is not, may I suggest you spend that time talking to a nurse, talking to a worker in aged care, because they are at breaking point. They go into work every day trying to care for the residents who have served our country, who have been part of our community, who deserve to spend this time in their life living in dignity. And these workers who want to provide that to those in their care do not have the support from the minister. They do not have the support from the government that they need to do their jobs, jobs which they are paid a pittance for, $22 an hour, and then a government who won't even stand up and make a submission on their behalf. A government who doesn't care. A minister who goes to the cricket and then comes in here and argues word games around whether or not this sector is in crisis. This sector is in crisis. People are dying. Workers are struggling. This is a crisis. And it deserves the full attention of the minister. It deserves a minister who shows up to work, who shows up to the committee which is there to hold him accountable, who shows up to this parliament and doesn't go into the ridiculous politics and word games which distract and run down the clock on his answers in question time. <coughs> These workers deserve so much more from this government. They deserve more than thanks. They deserve to be paid properly for the work that they do. They deserve to be supported by a broader workforce amongst them, by, by shifts being filled. They deserve to be supported by having the boosters that will protect them when they go into their workplace each day. And they shouldn't have to make the kind of choices that they have to make every single day. They shouldn't have to make choices about which resident in pain or in distress or in need to go to. But they have to make these choices because there aren't enough staff in this workforce. There isn't enough support from the government. Denying it's in crisis, it's an absurd thing to come in here and do. This sector has been struggling for long, long before this pandemic. The Royal Commission report was entitled Neglect. That was before the pandemic. And you overlay these issues on top of a sector which was struggling that much. And then you take a minister and a government more interested in the politics than supporting the workers, caring for our elderly, caring for our age, making devastating choices every single day. Those workers deserve so much better, as does every single Australian in aged care. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Canavan. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. There's some uh, truth in uh, at the end there of Senator Smith's contribution that I'd like to agree with. There is no doubt that the aged care centre uh, has been uh, under a lot of stress uh, uh, before uh, the pandemic. There is no doubt that uh, there are needs to be more funding uh, for aged care in this country. Uh, and of course, uh, a pandemic, which uh, no one uh, could have predicted the timing of, uh, was always going to put uh, much stress on, on that system. Uh, the government, this government, though, uh, has uh, responded to, as uh, Senator Smith the long, said, the long years of neglect, the years of neglect going back uh, through previous governments uh, of both sides of politics. But it has been this government that commissioned uh, a royal commission uh, into look at the state of the aged care centre, centre, uh, sector, warts and all, warts and all, 
And it is this government that is responding to that commission with record amounts of additional funding over the years to come. Of course, not every problem or issue can be solved overnight. The problems have emerged over many decades uh, and therefore cannot uh, be solved in, in a year or two. Uh, that extra funding will have an impact over time, and I'll come to that later. But before I get to that detail, I did want to acknowledge uh, the commitment, uh, the hard work and, and the stress uh, that uh, aged care workers must have gone through over the past two years. It was already uh, a strained and stressful environment for workers in that sector, um, but to have the extra uh, uh, obligations uh, of being COVID safe, to have the uh, extra staff pressures of isolation rules and COVID cases uh, has, of course, um, put those people on the front lines under great strain. I pay tribute uh, to the work they have done. And in, in, in tough times, I believe they've done, that sector as a whole, has done the best it could uh, to handle this once in a century pandemic. Uh, there does need to be more funding to improve aged care centres in this country. Uh, uh, there does need to be more money available to attract staff and uh, potentially increase wages over time to, to do that, uh, to keep up with the offers that exist now and through the NDIS. That's been another uh, care sector that's been well funded by this government. Uh, uh, that is putting competition there for these types of staff in aged care centres. And, and we have to respond by offering attractive employment options uh, to those that love and want to continue to work in the aged care sector as well. That's why the government is putting forward $18 billion of funding in response to the Royal Commission. Uh, uh, that this is going to make a difference over time. I say it's not going to happen overnight, but we have, through the pandemic, put an additional $600 million into bonuses for staff in the sector to provide an immediate top-up. But the long, over the longer term, over the longer term, what we need to do is grow incrementally the funding that exists in the aged care pool, such that providers, uh, both public and private, can offer uh, a reasonable and competitive wage uh, to those who work in the sector. Now, there have been suggestions from the other side of this debate that somehow, somehow, the government should, or Canberra bureaucrats here, uh, should should impose these wages, should just automatically or or unilaterally increase wages across the sector. That's not how our industrial relations systems work, nor should it be how it works, because almost invariably we'll get it wrong here in Canberra. We'll stuff it up. We'll stuff it up. If we try and centrally plan every aged care sector in the country, there'll be enormous perverse outcomes. We'll have uh, uh, um, some wage rates inapplicable for some types of work or some centres in regional areas, and there'll be devastation across the land. What we need to do is respect the industrial relations framework we have through the Fair Work Commission and have, and have viable, well-funded aged care centres that can respond to that process. That's we saw during question time. We saw that the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Albanese, knows how that, that system works. That's what he said in response to it, that we need to let the Fair Work Commission work. But the opposition didn't want to hear. They tried to silence. The opposition tried to silence the leader, their own leader, their leader of the opposition in question time. Every time the minister tried to express and say, hey, look, this is what Mr Albanese, the leader of the opposition, thinks, how the system works, this is what he believes, the Labor Party would get up and say, oh, no, there's a point of order, they're quoting our leader. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Why are you quoting Mr Albanese? They tried to shut it down. But I do agree with Mr Albanese on this point, that what we need to do here is have a flexible uh, approach uh, to this industry, which provides well fund funding but allows individual aged care centres to work with their workforces and their customers and uh, the um, aged uh, members of the Australian community to get the best outcomes we can during this pandemic and beyond. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Grogan. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, Minister Colwack told us today in this chamber that he will hold others to account. He will hold to account the Quality and Safety Commission. He'll hold to account aged care providers. He will hold to account the opposition. But what he didn't do and what he refused to do was to acknowledge his responsibilities, acknowledge the failures, acknowledge the lack of care and support over the pandemic by this government. The pandemic is not a surprise. We've been at this since 2019, early 2019. Yet we are seeing this crisis continue because, yes, aged care is 
in crisis. But this government is incapable of planning, incapable since 2019 of seeing what devastation can occur with vulnerable people. So they are incapable of protecting our vulnerable people. Where were the vaccines to minimise the impact? Where was the PPE to stop the spread? Where was the plan to protect our vulnerable older people? The aged care sector is in crisis. And the most crucial issue over time has been that of the workforce, to have sufficient trained people to look after our vulnerable older people. The current crisis and chronic shortages are a result of almost nine long, long years of neglect. This government in 2013 killed off a workforce compact that was negotiated by Labor to improve the wages of aged care staff. The work done by Labor while in government included a revamp of aged care, significant changes to protect older people, to provide choices for older people, to improve the wages of staff doing vitally important work in the aged care sector. And when this government came in in 2013, they scrapped some of the most critical aspects of that reform. And we are seeing the result of that right now. Chronic staff shortages. We have older people in residential air, air, aged care facilities right now living in unbearable conditions. Why? Because the pandemic has meant that the staff shortages have got situations where we have staff looking after up to 60 people. And we heard earlier, where do they go? There's someone fallen over. There's somebody soiled. There's somebody who needs to be fed. There's somebody having a, a medical situation. How do they appropriate their time when they are looking after 60 people at a time? It is an unconscionable situation. It is a situation that could have been planned for. It is a situation that, as Australians, we should all be embarrassed about. The standard of care for residents has plunged to alarming new lows, partly because there are staff shortages and partly because we are not looking appropriately at the running of the aged care sector. More than 500 people in aged care have died during COVID. This is a completely unacceptable situation. And all we have is Minister Colbeck standing in front of us today, not taking any responsibility, defending the fact that he spent three days at the cricket, defending the fact that he hasn't met with various people to deal with this crisis, that he has consistently not taken responsibility. The aged care minister says that the sector is not in crisis, but just about everyone living in it and working in it and looking at it says that it is. People deserve better. Our older people deserve better. When the AMA advised in September of 2021 that there was trouble coming, that there was going to be greater challenges with the new variant, Omicron particularly, um, came to bear on that, the government did nothing. They didn't plan. They didn't think about how they were going to protect vulnerable people in this country. They just went about their business, went to the cricket, paid no attention. This situation is a disgrace and we should all be ashamed of the situation we find ourselves in. Thank you, Senator Grogan. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Billick to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the Minister representing the Minister of Home Affairs' response to my questions. Thank you. I asked about innocent people seeking refuge who are locked up at the Park Hotel prison. Now, let me make this very clear. They came not in contravention of border protection rules, as the minister uh, made out. 
And may I remind you that our international obligation is to grant protection to people seeking asylum and granted refugee status. The only disrespect that has occurred in question time today is by this government's inhumane treatment of people seeking refuge in this country. How can this government claim that this is not locking people up? Locked in one room for up to nine years. A young fella's been in there since he was 15. It's heartbreaking. He's locked up. He spent his adult life. He's still there. His whole adult life has been in a hotel room against his will, being tortured by the Australian government. Tortured. He peeks out the window with a sign saying, help me, please, let me out. I need fresh air. I want to talk to people. I want to see people. I need food, fresh food, not stale bread. And we've even heard about maggots in food. I just can't believe we live in a country that continues to deny people's human rights and continues to terrorise innocent young people and take away their dignity and their human rights. What kind of people are we as a country if we can do that to a 15-year-old who's still in a room for nine years locked away by the Australian government? I'm sure everyone knows how lockdown has been for us in our homes, with our families, with fresh food. You can go to the park with your dog sometimes. Can you just think for one moment what these people, these innocent people who came here seeking our help, think about them for one moment when you're in lockdown. Because they don't have the freedoms that you have they certainly don't have the privilege that you have. Imagine nine years in your room, in your room, as, as privileged as it might be, still nine years in there and you holding a sign to the window saying, please let me out. This government has no empathy I don't know what empathy training was done, but maybe we need to improve the training because there's certainly no regard for human rights. There's certainly no regard for the decent treatment of innocent human beings. I've stood outside the Park Hotel as what you would say is an activist or a protester but I stood outside that hotel with elders, non-Aboriginal elders, who were crying, who were in pain, seeing the pain in these people, in, in these innocent people's eyes when they looked down to you from their window, begging to be free. This is not about activists. This is about freedom for innocent Senator people. Thorpe, um, your time has expired. So the question is that we take note of the um, motion moved by Senator Thorpe. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Thank you.